under the age of 18 sometimes complained about this new year, but most parents I know rejoice in the fall when the new school year begins. <laughs> Whether you're a parent or a child or someone outside these life stages, odds are you recognize the time of year and the change in schedule that the new school year brings. Here in Bend, although the speeds around school zones are reduced, so are the number of cars around Bend too. We can actually make it from one side of town to the other side of town in a reasonable amount of time because often the construction ends too. And with the new school year comes new schedules. And new schedules create new routines. And new routines are opportunities to include new activities. Activities like coming to church on Sunday morning or bringing kids to youth group on Wednesday night or, or maybe even joining a new core group or Bible study that you heard about. This is a concept that was noticed by the church culture across the U.S. a number of years ago. And the idea of National Back to Church Sunday sprouted into an event recognized by churches all across the country. We join a movement that's not meant to help people make a place in their lives for being part of a local church. That's what National Back to Church Sunday is all about. And you have a role in that. You, sitting here in these seats, listening online, you have a role in that. And as we think about and talk about Back to Church Sunday, it's important to know that the belief here at Compass Church is that church is the family of God. And there's always room in that family for more people. This morning we set the stage for the fall sharing God's love with Bend and Beyond. That's what we're, we're going to set the stage for what we plan on do, doing to share that love with people. And we're going to start that with a new series called Going Deep. When we plant our lives in the right environment, and the church is the right environment, our roots can go deep and they can draw the nutrients needed to produce good fruits in our lives. And through the series, this four-part series, which is actually like a, like a one-part plus three-part series, this week we're going to share the vision. We're going to go deep in sharing. And this is a topic of each week. Each week we have these practices that will help us understand what it is to get deep into the rich soil that produces great fruit. So this week we're going to go deep in sharing. Next week we'll go deep in faith and what it is to actually follow Jesus. And the week after that we're going to go deep in prayer and worship. And then finally we're going to go deep in community. These are the four parts that we're going to do through this series called Going Deep. And the local church is the right environment to develop this strong foundation in these four areas. The old adage, you are the company you keep, rings true. If we surround ourselves with people who love and serve God, it encourages us to do the same. And that will inspire us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people who don't yet know it, people who aren't yet part of God's family, but can be right here at Compass or another local church. Other than the good news of Jesus Christ, of course, when was the last time you had good news to share? I want you to think back to that time. It could have been a new job or, or the purchasing of a house or an engagement, a pregnancy or something else. I remember when Hillary and I first found out that we were pregnant with our first child, who, by the way, turned 13 last week. That's uncool. You guys were all wooing, and I'm wooing for a different reason. But almost 14 years ago, Hillary and I found out that Aubrey would join our family in about nine short months. And when we found out, I wanted to tell everybody. There wasn't a person around that I didn't want to scream at and say, I'm having a baby. But initially, we found out using an at-home test. And so we wanted to confirm it. We wanted to confirm that this at-home test was actually true. It was telling us right information. So Hillary called and made an appointment with a doctor to confirm that she was pregnant. The first available slot was a couple weeks away. And the week that we called, it was actually the week between Christmas and New Year's. It's that week of, of school vacations and, and of parties, and you have holiday parties and New Year's parties. Well, we had to figure out a way to go to this epic New Year's party without anyone finding out why Hillary wasn't going to take part in the New Year's celebrational toast. We made it through that party without anyone asking why Hillary wasn't drinking. Mostly because every drink she got, she poured into my cup, so no one would find out. I lived. 
A few weeks later, the doctors confirmed that Hillary was, in fact, pregnant. And we were able to share the news with people. And I'm, I'm not lying when I tell you that everyone I came across knew that we were having a baby. I drive through Dutch Brothers, and the baristas there would already know that I was having a baby because I had already told them the last time I was there the other day. I tell people in the grocery store, you know, you know those odd people that like to talk to you in line when all they want to do is get through the line and go home and have dinner? I was that odd guy. Hey, I'm Matt. We're having a baby. Good for you. I was so excited that even at the gym, someone would be like, can you spot me? Sure, I'm having a baby. And I go over and spot them. I was so excited that even in my college class, I was teaching up at the college that time, I gave them three consecutive nights off of homework. And then on a test, I actually made my bonus question, is your teacher having a baby? That was the bonus question. And most people didn't get the points. You know why? Because Hillary was having the baby, not me. I gave them all points because I was so happy, whether they answered it right or wrong. But of course, the point here is that when we have news to share, we're so excited. We can't wait to share this good news with people, with everyone we meet. And there's nothing more exciting than your soul reconnecting with God through the cross of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more exciting than that. I think sometimes we, we dumb it down a little bit, but there is nothing more exciting than your soul that was once dead, had breath pushed into it and came to life because of what Jesus did. The greatest news that anyone can receive is found all over the pages of Scripture. That's why the most famous and well-known verse in the world, from football fields to World Cup matches, is posted, John 3.16, for everyone to see. Because it is such great news, and people want to make sure that everybody knows it. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Some versions say begotten to make sure that we understand that Jesus is God. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It continues actually. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of and the only Son of God. But that's not the only good news. There's more good news in the Bible. Romans 5.8 says, God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is good news. But like a great infomercial, wait, there's more. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, who was sinless, who lived a perfect life, took our sin on him so that we could instead be seen like him as the righteousness of God. And let us not forget the Apostle Paul talking to the believers in Ephesus. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's a gift. And this is great news. And there's Countless more verses that tell us this same great news. That God loves the world so much, that God loves you so much, that he sent his only begotten son to this earth to live a perfect life, a sinless life, but choose to take the payment for our sins. And because he lived that perfect life, because he was sinless, his payment was permanent. And that's a reason for us to rejoice. Because in that permanent payment, we became the righteousness of God. All we have to do is believe in it. If you're a follower of Jesus, do you remember when you became a Christian? Do you remember that moment? Some of us, it was a, it was a moment, stark. Others of us, it was a process. And at one point, we said, you know what? I've come to believe in who Jesus is. Regardless of what your personal experience is, you came to a point where you believed the good news. You believed that that news was in fact good. And at that moment, whether it was one point or a process, you went from darkness to light. You went from death to life. That's good news. But the question is, what makes good news good? What makes good news good? Well, what makes good news good is that it's better than the news you had before. Right? That news might be bad, but either way, the news you have now is better than the news you had before. That's good. That's good news. 
And the status of people who haven't yet been saved is that they are not saved. That's bad news. But the good news is Jesus did all the work in order to save those people. He did it. It's a free gift from God. This is why the news is so good. Because without it, we're dead in our sins. But with it, by believing in Jesus Christ as Lord, we can go from deadbeat to disciple. We can go from dead to life. And disciples do at least three things in their life as a follower of Jesus Christ. So I want to go through those three things as we share the vision of what we want to do. Because our vision here at Compass is to be the beautiful feet of those who share the good news. The good news is worth sharing. And we want to make sure we understand that. The first thing that disciples do as a follower of Jesus is disciples know they are disciples. Disciples know they are disciples. Now, at the surface, this seems like a duh statement. Well, of course a disciple would know he's a disciple, but I want you to think about this for a second. A few weeks ago, we talked about how the name the Bible gives to the people that followed Jesus, or at least originally followed Jesus, was not Christian. That came later. The name was actually disciple. Disciple of who? Disciple of Jesus. They were followers of the way. And as disciples, they were known to be imitators and wanting to be like Jesus Christ. That's what Christian actually means, little Christ. Christian actually was an insult at first. Oh, look at you and your baby Jesus. Well, yeah, I want to be a baby Jesus. I actually want to grow into the full image of Jesus as much as I can to make other people realize that Jesus died for us, that we are saved through his sacrifice. But as I thought of this, I wondered, as I thought about this this week, I was putting this together, I wondered, does it make more sense if we started calling ourselves disciples again? I mean, how would people respond instead of us saying, I'm a Christian, if we actually said, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ? What if we said that? Odds are, people would ask, what's that mean, or what's the difference? To the early church, there was no difference. There was no difference between the word Christian or disciple. They were synonymous to the early church. But I think over the years, we've let the meaning of Christian wane a little bit. Oh, it's just, it's just my religion. Oh, it's just, it's just part of my worldview. Oh, I go to church on Sundays because I'm a Christian. Like being a Christian is not as big of a commitment as being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I have an addiction I must confess to you guys. The Bible says we should confess our sins. I don't know if this is a sin, but I'm going to confess to you anyway. You may already know this. I'm a podcast junkie. I am. I listen to podcasts everywhere I go. I love driving down the road and listening to podcast after podcast. I come into work and I tell Kelly about the podcast I listen to when he rolls his eyes. If I'm being honest, whenever I'm driving someplace with my family and I love them, I can't wait to get them out of the car so I can put on a podcast. I'm definitely an addict and I probably need therapy for it. But with podcasts, I love many different topics. But the topic I listen to most is the Christian worldview or Christian leadership. It's most applicable to my life. I learn the most from it. And I intentionally listen to podcasts that have differing opinions because I want to explore all viewpoints and then I want to bring them back to the Bible to see if they're valid. Most of them are not sermons. But instead, they are opinions about some issue that the podcaster believes needs to be addressed in the church or Christianity as a whole. Most of them are more politically motivated than they are Christianly convincing, which means they're all crap. <laughs> but it does help me understand where the currents and the themes are that may be running through people's minds. I think that's important. I think that most of these issues that would be resolved if people would really consider themselves disciples of Jesus rather than just Christians or churchgoers. Because a disciple actively follows and imitates Jesus. Most of the issues we hear are issues that could be resolved from that. But I do think, if we think about issues within the American church and everybody has their opinion, I do wonder, have we forgot that we're also disciples? Have we forgot that we're supposed to actively learn and imitate Jesus Christ in every aspect of our life? We aren't supposed to imitate Jesus just on Sunday morning or even Sunday afternoon when it's fresh in our mind, but on Monday as well, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and every day. So point one is, 
a disciple knows he's a disciple. So let's cho choose to align these words. Yes, it's perfectly okay to call yourself a Christian. But realize that when you call yourself a Christian, you also are calling yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that means something. It means we must be active in becoming more like him and imitating him. Point two is a disciple desires to make disciples. A disciple desires to make disciples. Jesus said in the Bible, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He told his disciples this in John 14. It's recorded for, for us as disciples in 2023 to understand that if we love Jesus, we will keep his commandments. Not just some of them, but we'll work hard to keep all of them. And he wasn't telling them this so that they could earn his love. No, he already loves us. Jesus already loves you. He loves you so much he chose to go to the cross for you 2,000 years ago. But what he is saying is that our love for him should burn in us a desire to follow his commands, to do life the way he prescribes, to walk through life as a new creation, understanding that we're reconnected to God in a real way, and as such, we should want to please him because we love him. We should love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. This is a command. We should love our neighbors as ourselves. It's a command. We should joyfully serve others. We should rejoice. We should forgive others, even when we think they're not worth forgiving, because it's a command. There are literally dozens of commands that Jesus gives his disciples that we should deeply desire to keep. Now, this may sting a little bit, but sometimes facing a difficult truth can hurt. But thankfully, God is graceful and forgives us. And when I say this, I'm not just saying it to people hearing me. I'm also saying it to myself because it's equally true for all of us. But if we don't have a desire to follow Jesus' commands, maybe we aren't disciples. We should desire to follow Jesus' commands. But there's a command that Jesus gives us that can help even here. Even if we don't have a burning desire in us to follow every Jesus command there is, Jesus calls us to follow him. And in doing so, we'll learn to follow every command and, and desire to do it. I share this not because I want people to step away. I'm not saying that, oh, well, I don't desire to follow Jesus' command, so maybe I shouldn't come to church. No, I share it because I want you to step up. I want you to be lifted up, to be more, to be what God calls you to be, which is truly his image bearer, and proclaim that he wants other people to recognize they need to plug back into God as well. So if you want to be a desire, but you don't have the desire to keep, oh sorry, if you want to be a disciple, yet you don't have the desire to keep his commands, bring it to God. Pray about it through the Holy Spirit that fills the follower of Jesus Christ to help you with that desire. That Holy Spirit's there for that reason, for many others as well. But it's to help us understand what it means to follow Christ. But if we have a desire to follow his commands, we must have a desire also to make disciples. The final command that Jesus gave his disciples before ascending into heaven was go and make disciples. It wasn't make Christians. It wasn't make converts. It wasn't to go to church on Sunday morning. It was go and make disciples. And this wasn't a command just given to a couple of the leaders of the group. It was given to the whole group. And as such, it was given to all of us as well. So we should be a disciple that desires to make disciples, which means we should desire to proclaim the good news and be the beautiful feet of those who bring the good news. Number three, a disciple models a life of discipleship. A disciple models a life of discipleship. You may have heard it said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Kelly spoke on this a few months ago, and to sum it all up, he said it was bunk. It's not necessarily true. It's misunderstood. This statement has been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, who's a famous Italian friar who became so famous that Catholic churches around the world and, and schools as well were named for him. We actually have a, 
a church here in Bend called St. Francis of Assisi. But this statement was made famous in a 1991 publication called The Daily Bread. I don't know if you guys remember that. I actually don't know how many people here were even born before 1991. I was going to ask, but I don't want to feel old. But here's, here's what it said. It said, St. Francis once invited a young monk to join him on a trip to preach. Honored to be invited, the monk readily accepted. All day long, he and Francis walked through the streets, byways, alleys, and into the suburbs. They rubbed shoulders with hundreds of people. At day's end, the two headed back home. Not once did St. Francis address a crowd or talk to anyone about the gospel. Greatly disappointed, his young companion said, I thought we were going into town to preach. And St. Francis responded, My son, we have preached. We were preaching while we were walking. We were seen by many, and our behavior was closely watched. It is of no use to walk anywhere to preach unless we preach everywhere we walk. This is a story shared on December 15, 1991. But I believe this statement is misunderstood. You see, St. Francis wasn't saying you don't have to use words when sharing the gospel. That's not what he was saying. People often take this to say, well, I don't have to speak about Jesus. I don't have to talk to people about Jesus. That's not what he means here. The point is clearly that your life should match the worldview you claim to have. That's the point here. As we walked, people were watching us closely to see, are we walking the walk after we talked the talk? People knew what he was going to say. People knew that he was going to preach. Instead, what they were looking is, does, does your walk match your talk? And that life should be used in conjunction with words to illustrate the fact that Jesus saves and has saved you. You know what one of the biggest complaints non-Christians have about Christians? One of the biggest ones. We're hypocrites. And I love Kelly's truthful joke that says, yep, and we have room for one more, so come to church with me on Sunday. <laughs> now the issue is that as a follower of Jesus, we're trying to live like Jesus, but we can't. He was sinless. He was perfect. And we are not, even when we believe we are. But along with people's misunderstandings about the teachings of Jesus, people see the lives of people that claim to be Christian whose lives look nothing like Jesus. When people say they're Christian, but they live unchristian like lives, they do more to prevent the gospel than to bring it. Our lives are the reason that someone might accept Jesus, might step into this role of disciple, but our lives might be also the reason why people dismiss it and never come into church. So if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, let's make the conscious choice to make our lives reflect reflect Jesus even more than it already does. All of us can reflect Jesus more than we already are. Even, even if we reflect him really well and better than anybody you know, you can still reflect him more because he was Jesus and you are not. Me neither. Those are the three points I have. But I actually have one more. Like a good infomercial, there's more. As a bonus, I'm going to give you one more point. The fourth point is, a disciple believes the good news. A disciple believes the good news. Earlier, I had asked you if you remembered the moment you became a follower of Jesus Christ. Some people nodded. Some people shrugged their shoulders. Some people just looked down and refused to look at me. Whatever it was, I asked you to remember. And if you remembered what it was like to recognize your need for the good news... When you recognize your need for the good news, what you're in fact recognizing is that you need to be saved. And that saving is available. Now, I want to make sure that you hear this this morning. Whether you're listening to me in this room or you're listening online now or later, I want you to leave with this. So if you're a note taker, even if you're not a note taker, maybe you should reconsider. But you should take this down. So you may want to take out a pen or paper or... If you're a techie person, take out a phone. If you're not a techie person, you can pretend. But whatever it is that helps you remember this point, I want you to remember this point. Are you ready? 
The good news remains good news regardless of how long it's been since you first believed it. The good news remains good news regardless of how long it's been since you first believed it. It is still good news. In Matthew 11, John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin, was sitting in jail. He was sitting in jail because he spoke against King Herod marrying his brother's wife. He was sitting in jail because he proclaimed that even if you aren't following God, you should still live by his morals. It's just healthy. And because Herod didn't want to hear it, he threw him in jail. When people are loving their life of sin, they will lash out at people that point out that they're living in sin. We can love them. We can lovingly share things with them. But it may not prevent them from lashing out. John the Baptist found this out the hard way. Eventually, Herod would behead him. But as you can imagine, John's sitting in this jail. And he had preached and prepared people to receive the message of the Messiah. He had prepared the way for Jesus Christ, the Savior of people. He had begun to lose hope while he sat in this jail cell, though. He wondered, he let this outside circumstances wondered, have I placed my hope in something real? And what he did was he, he sent a messenger, a couple messengers, to ask Jesus something. Was Jesus really the good news that John had been hoping for? As he looked forward, he realized that I might not have long to live. So is Jesus really it? Let's close by looking at these verses to help us remember that the good news is still the good news. Beginning at the first verse of Matthew 11, it says, When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Okay, pause there a second. This, this one single verse rebuts the preach the gospel and use words if necessary. You want to be like Jesus? You want to be his disciple? Then teach and preach in the cities. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to stand up in front of someone and talk to a crowd, but it does mean you have to talk. Verse 2, now when John, John the Baptist, heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and he said to them, are you the Messiah who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When John the Baptist is struggling to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, he goes to Jesus and he asks. That's not dissimilar to what we should do. We should go to Jesus and ask. But Jesus replies with, look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. The good news is preached. Here in 2023, we, we may not see some of the same things that Jesus saw or that people that follow Jesus saw. But we can look at the changed lives of people. Lives are changed, and that's still a miracle. People who have come to follow Jesus, we can look at their transformed life and say, there's a miracle. There's evidence of Jesus being real. Here at Compass and churches all over the world, lives are changed. Hopeless have been given hope. The broken have been healed, whether it's emotional or physical. Relationships have been reconciled. Perspectives have been risen. Souls have been brought to life. These are all miracles that continue to happen today. This is the good news, and it continues to be the good news forever and always. Amen? As a part of the family of God, we don't, we don't want you, sorry, sorry, let me rephrase that. As, a fam, as part of the family of God, don't you want to tell other people the good news? I mean, isn't it something that, that we want to make sure people know? Like, hey, your soul has been unplugged from its creator and there's a way you can reconnect. It's through Jesus Christ. Wouldn't we want people to know about that? Of course we would. Of course, people, people who are disciples of Jesus want to un help people understand that they too can be disciples of Jesus. So how are we going to share that with people? How are we going to share that with people? Now, this next week, I want you to think about who you're going to share that with. It could be a friend, could be a family member, could be a neighbor, could be a coworker, could be a fellow student or teammate. But who are you going to share? 
Who are you going to invite to church next week for Back to Church Sunday? We're looking forward to what God's going to do. So much so that we had 1,300 of these mailed out to people around town. Now, these only get sold in groups of 500. So we have 200 extra for you to take and invite someone to, t- to church next week. They're right next to the door as you walk out. Take one, two, seven of these, I don't care, and invite someone to come with you next week. The new school year is a time where people are looking to solidify their schedules. So they might be more open to placing church on Sunday morning into that schedule. Who are you going to invite? Have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about not just an opportunity to invite someone, but that you recognize and you're bold to take advantage of that opportunity? Hey, let me tell you something. You do not have to pray for an opportunity to share Jesus with someone. Those opportunities are there. No doubt about it. You have to pray for boldness to share that opportunity, take advantage of that opportunity to invite them to church. Those opportunities are all over the place. I had a student one time, I'm going off script, but that's okay, you'll forgive me, I hope, because disciples also forgive. Um, I had a student a number of years ago, and we were uh, at the Boys and Girls Club, and we had Sunday morning youth group. So we had two services, the second service, the high schoolers came up, and we did a high school-only lesson. It was really neat. But when I asked what they had done that morning, one of my students said, I grabbed a coffee at Starbucks. And I was like, well, it's not Dunkin' Donuts, but that's okay. And she said, the barista asked me what I was doing. And I was literally walking to church, which is only less than a quarter mile away from this Starbucks. They asked me what I was doing. And instead of saying, I'm going to church, do you want to come when you get off, or do you want to go next Sunday, or whatever, I said nothing. What are you doing? nothing. And that person said, you know what I realized? There's opportunities all over the place to invite people to church. We just got to be bold and take advantage of them. So take a lesson from Anna. She wants you to invite that person. When that opportunity arises, take advantage of it. Not this Anna, a different Anna. (laughs) Just just for the record. So, Next week is National Back to Church Sunday. We're prepared for God to do something awesome. I know we will. You can be a part of that. So let's be disciples that remember the good news by living a life that reflects Jesus with a desire to make disciples. That's what I'm leaving you with today. Be a disciple that remembers the good news by living a life that reflects Jesus with a desire to make disciples. And finally, if you're here this morning and you recognize your need for some good news. You recognize that without Jesus, you are not going to live through eternity, at least not the way you want to. You recognize your need to be saved. Well, today's your day. Today's it. Maybe you thought you recognized it before, but you didn't really. You hadn't bought in. You hadn't become a disciple. You prayed the, I became a Christian prayer, but you actually haven't changed your life to actually follow and reflect Jesus. Well, today's your day. Because Jesus desires to save you right here and now. Jesus desires to be in a relationship with you starting today. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 10, 9, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. That's it. That's all you have to do to begin your adventure of discipleship. And if you've made that decision this morning... If, that's someone, if you're someone who's made that decision, you know what? I'm going to choose to follow Jesus today. I'm going to choose to be a disciple. I'm not just going to say I'm a Christian, but I'm actually going to follow Christ. If that's you, we have a bag. We put together a bag for you with resources for a new believer. We actually call it a new believer bag because we're super original. But I'll tell you what. This bag has some awesome resources in it, and it's going to help you walk the walk with Jesus since you talked the talk. So grab one on your way out, because we're excited to walk alongside with you. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, I ask for boldness. I ask that as we, disciples of, of you, are walking through our life, that we don't come across an opportunity and are surprised by it to share you with people. We don't go through life unprepared, but instead 
we prepare an answer for the hope we might have in you. We think about the people that we might have an opportunity to share and invite. We've prayed about an opportunity, maybe with specific people, maybe with someone in our family or our neighborhood or someone in our class or at our workplace, maybe some random person in the grocery store line, Lord. But, Lord, help us be bold. Help us live our faith out loud. Help us not be deceived by the misunderstanding that we don't have to use words to preach the gospel. Help us share our stories, how we have been saved, how Jesus has affected us personally. Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do this week with the encounters that, that people are going to have with others who may not yet be a family of God. And Lord, we thank you that there's always room. There's always room for more in the family of God. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, as we leave here today, help us recognize that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. That part of the triune Godhead lives in us. And Lord, we may not know every answer, and that's okay. But help us recognize that the Holy Spirit's there to help us, guide us, counsel us, to take advantage, to follow the command to make disciples. Lord, we love you, and it's your name we pray. Amen.